I'm Dr. Vinay Prasad. I'm an associate professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. I'm trying something new here. This is something that people have requested I talk about. So this is called How to Keep Up with the Literature, Internal Medicine Resident Edition. And it's really for the internal medicine residents out there. People are going to be interns in the near future. How can you keep up with the literature on a week-by-week -week basis during your residency? So with that, let me give this a shot. Disclaimer. Well, of course, this is not evidence-based. I haven't randomized several hundred people to my strategy or an alternative strategy to prove that comprehension, critical thinking are better by my strategy. However, that's something that intrigues me and that if I had uh, unlimited time, I would prioritize and do, but I don't. But I also want to remind us that then again, in this sphere, how we keep up with the literature, how we stay abreast of medical knowledge, um, there is no well-done, well-controlled studies that actually can inform us of the best strategies. So to some degree, we're all going to have to make choices in the absence of those studies. It really isn't quite the same like taking a pill. So if you like what I have to say, you're free to follow it. And if you don't, no pressure. You don't have to. There's probably many alternative ways you can try to keep up with the literature. These are just my two cents. So I guess I'm going to talk about two central strategies of keeping up broadly with internal medicine. One is you got to keep up with things on a week by week basis and build a good habit. So how when new information comes out, you're going to be able to assess it, make sense of it and bring it into your fund of knowledge. And the next thing is really the real central virtue of, I think, internal medicine residency is how you can continually learn from your patients. There's something special about seeing somebody and using their story and their experience and your interactions with that person to cement in your mind some facts, um, some understanding of the clinical disease, of the treatments, of the presentation. It really is a great way to learn, and you have to take advantage of that in residency. It's one of the great opportunities. So let's start with the first part, keeping up broadly with the literature. Now listen, I know you're busy. You will be lucky to have time to do anything in residency, let alone keep up with the literature. But it's really important that you start this habit now, I believe, because it's going to serve you well in, over the course of your career. Now, I'm going to try to recommend a uh, strategy so that you probably read only two articles a week. So that's what I'm hoping for by the end of this. So one way is you need to keep up broadly. And by that, I mean, you need a strategy where you know what people are talking about. What are the new things coming out? And this is just a simple way that I would suggest you do it. One, this is a week schedule, Monday through Friday, and you got to build this into your weekly routine. Make it a practice. Make it a habit. And there's a certain logic to why I'm going to have you do it this way. So here's what you need to know. Monday, around middle of the day, and it depends on what time zone you're in, but JAM Internal Medicine drops new articles, typically online first on JAM Internal Medicine website. Tuesday, again, middle of the day, the JAMA Network, Mama Jama, drops new articles on the website. And then, of course, Wednesday, there's no place you'd rather be at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time than checking out the website of the New England Journal of Medicine. They're going to drop new articles, typically as a current issue. A new issue will drop then, although some online articles will also pop up at that time. And the reason I remember these times is this is roughly, more or less, when I check in on these sources. So I'm going to be on JAMA Journal Medicine website on the afternoon of Monday. I'm going to be on JAMA's website on the afternoon of Tuesday, and New England Journal probably at 2.05 p.m. Pacific time, since I'm out on the West Coast, I'm going to be checking in to see what people are going to be talking about, and I want to stay abreast of the discussion. So when you pull up the website, here's what you're going to see. I've shrunk it down for you. You're going to see a bunch of ads, useless ads on the right. Please ignore those ads. Boy, these journals, they really are clogging themselves up with advertisements, if you ask me, but you're also going to find the table of contents. And I think you got to take a quick glance through. You just want to see the titles, you want to see the authors, and you want to figure out what's going to make it um, past your initial screen. So here's how I like to think about it. First, I skim all the letters to the editor. I skim them real quickly. And you're going to want to do that too. And in a couple of slides, it's going to make perfect sense for you why I say that. Next, if it's a perspective article, if it's an opinion article, I'm only going to read it if I either personally know the authors, which these days I sometimes do. Uh, it wasn't always the case, especially when I was a resident. Um, but I might know of the authors, and that might be sufficient basis. Um, or if I care deeply about that topic, if that's a topic that really rings a bell inside of me. And I'll be honest with you, that's not a whole heck of a lot of topics for me personally, but everybody's different. Original articles. This is really where I'm going to focus my attention. I'm going to dive in here. I'm going to skim all the titles. 
I'm going to look through all the titles and I'm going to have a bit of a triage method. This is the same thing that you do in an emergency room setting when you are dealing with a massive influx of patients. You got to triage and you got to do the same thing with articles because there's more articles per week than there are hours to read them. So if it's an original article, here's what I think about. One, does it concern my medical practice? Is this something that has to do with being an internist or does it have to do with a subspecialty I might be interested in? That might be cardiology, GI, oncology is what I ended up going into, or pulmonary critical care. These are the things that were kind of swirling around in my mind. And if it's going to be something that I might go into or something I'm in right now, I'm going to want to spend some time thinking about it, potentially. But there are a few other things I look for. Is it a randomized study or is it an uncontrolled or observational or quasi-experimental study? I'm going to take a quick gander. And if I find that it is an uncontrolled study of, say, 80 people, that's going to be lower on my priority list than a randomized controlled trial of 8,000 people. Is it a large sample size or small? I guess I kind of talked about this just a second ago, but if it's a randomized trial, you know, if it's going to be 60 people per arm, it's going to be a little bit lower, then it's going to be 600 people per arm. Is it multi-center or single center? I think this is particularly applicable for interventions that have to do with social, behavioral, or process level changes, like tight glycemic control in the ICU, uh, like gown and glove protection in the ICU. If it's a gown and gloves kind of study, an early goal-directed therapy study, a tight glycemic index study, I'm gonna want it to be multi-center rather than single center because I know single center studies can be notoriously biased by a charismatic, um, proponent at that single center. Finally, is the clinical endpoint something that matters to patients in and of itself, like living longer, living better, overall survival, quality of life, or is it merely a surrogate endpoint, a stand-in for what we really care about, like LDL cholesterol or like A1C? So I'm going to skim the articles with this in mind, and these are just rules of thumb. They're not meant to be adhered to with absolute um, strictness, but for the most part, as a general rule of thumb, I'm much likely to choose articles on the left side of these uh, dichotomies than on the right side. You know, that's what I'm going to be spending my limited time on. I'm going to pick one article a week, max, to keep up with the literature. That's all the time I have for as an intern and as a resident. And maybe in the future I'll try to do better, but during internal medicine residency, I think this is like a good goal. One article a week. What am I going to do? I'm going to read the article, and I'm going to read it actively. I'm not just going to read it cover to cover. I'm going to kind of um, peck and hunt in the article, look for things that I want to uh, find out about. One, is the control arm something that I'm doing? So that's the first question I have. Are they testing something new, something established, but are they testing it against something that I'm already doing? Typically, articles are testing something novel. We know about three out of every four articles, especially in these journals from some work we've done. I test something novel. Um, is the control arm what's actually in my clinical practice? And often these trials are run in global settings where due to no fault of the host nation, uh, the standard of care is beneath the U.S. standard due to simple financial restrictions. And if the standard of care in the control arm isn't the standard in my clinic, I'm not sure the trial will be particularly relevant to change me and move me to a new standard or treatment. So that's the first question. Next. Are there games with patient selection? Now, I can go back, listen to some podcasts I've done on Paradigm, HF, but there are a number of ways in which patient selection can be gamed. So look at the inclusion criteria. Look to see if there's a drug run-in period. Look to see what the attrition is on the way into the study. Because the more selection biases and filters that take place on the way in, the less likely the results are to generalize to your practice or your setting. Next, I look at whether or not the endpoints are statistically significant or whether or not they're statistically significant and clinically meaningful. And it's sad. It's a sad commentary that we have to dis distinguish these two things, but it is increasingly necessary that not everything statistically significant matters to patients. And I think that's an important thing to think about. What is the effect size? Does it really matter? And for the article I read per week, the one article to keep up with the literature, I'm going to read the editorial. Often these editorials are uncritical praise for the article, and that's a failure, I think, of journals and lower journal standards. However, occasionally the editorial will teach you something interesting and provocative, and I think it's worth your time to read the editorial just to see if it's one of those rare exceptions. And then, the reason I asked you to skim the letters to the editor at the outset is that I'm going to go back, and if this article that I read happens to get a letter to the editor in the future, I'm 100% going to read that letter to the editor. That's often where gems are found. And these days, letters to the editor are very restrictive. They have very limited word counts, and very few of them are selected. But despite those challenges, you can sometimes read a letter that is quite good and cuts to the bone. Next, is anyone talking about it? You know, this is really 
I think, one of the virtues of social media, which is that now the whole point of my strategy makes sense. Why are you checking the article the day of? Why are you acting crazy, as some might believe? Um, and the answer is you want to at least witness the discussion. You want to read the article, skim the titles as people talk about it so you know what they're talking about. Maybe you haven't read the whole article, but at least you can connect it with what appeared in the New England Journal. And maybe later, if it piques your interest, you can go back and find it. And so I go to social media, I go to Twitter, and I look to see if there are any thoughtful comments or criticism or praise or disagreement with the study. And there often are. And the people who are thoughtful critics are the kinds of people you want to follow. And over time, you can build up your network. And I'm not going to be one of those people to give you a list of names which are inherently incomplete and often biased uh, uh, to, for whom to follow, but I think you can figure it out on your own based on your articles, your interests, who's talking about it in a way that you find compelling, who's giving you insights that you didn't see before. And I think that's really important because it's a free education. It's a free way you get to see what I think good readers of the literature are saying about the study. So that's the first central strategy. It's just that simple. That's how you keep up broadly with the internal medicine literature. The next strategy, the concurrent strategy, is learning from your patients as you go. And I think as an internal medicine resident, this is oh so valuable. Every day, print one up-to-date article before you leave. That's all it takes, I think, to connect with your patients. So what I'm suggesting is, before you leave, go on up-to-date, find an article that's connected to one of your patients. It has to do with the medical condition they're dealing with. Are they coming in with heart failure? Are they coming in with SARS-CoV-2? Whatever it is, print the up-to-date article. And this is not going to be very long. It's going to be between 5 and maybe 20 pages if you exclude the references. And it's going to have often a lot of bullet points. And a lot of that document is not going to be dense text. And you want to print this before you go because maybe you're going to read it that evening. And that's what I'm going to encourage you to do. So I just picked one example. Let's say hypothetically you're on a busy service where you've got a lot of patients coming in with COVID-19. After all, this is filmed during the peak of COVID-19, so it's obligatory that every single medical article mention COVID-19. We can't avoid mentioning it. And so, for instance, you might read the article and you'd read this sentence, which is, for patients with documented COVID-19, we do not routinely administer empiric therapy for bacterial pneumonia. Data are limited bacterial but bacterial superinfection does not appear to be a prominent feature of the disease. And you can read below that they forgive you, of course, if the patient came through the ED and you didn't yet have a diagnosis, but they make this general recommendation. And you can read through the article to see if they persuade you that this is logical. Is it really the case that bacterial superinfection is of so rare, is so rare that one does not require the use of antibiotics? And I think it's a good question. And you can probe your thinking on that topic. Read it quickly that night before bed. You know, just read the article and take, I think, with a grain of salt what they say, but accept a lot of what they say. Maybe it takes 15 minutes, but you get to see a lay of the land. For a disease that you might not know a whole lot about, you suddenly know um, quite a bit about. You know how one expert views it. You know how they see the lay of the land. Maybe it takes 15, 20 minutes. So that's all the time I'm going to ask you to spend that evening. Once a week, go back through the articles you read and pick one of them and for one reference, do a little bit of a dive. And I think this is the bonus step. This is what really solidifies the knowledge. Pick one reference in the five articles you printed on UpToDate and do a deeper dive on that reference. So just for instance, I picked the COVID-19 reference and of course it talks about the recovery trial, the UK study, one of my favorite studies. Um, and it talks about the subgroup, the, the, the arm, correction, not the subgroup, the arm of the study that received dexamethasone. Within that arm of the study, there are, of course, three subgroups, hospitalized patients who do not require O2, hospitalized patients who do require O2, and hospitalized patients who require mechanical ventilation. And there is a statistically significant interaction coefficient that might make you want to look that up and see what that is. And there's also a, I think, incremental difference in outcome based in each of these strata or subgroups, um, which is that if the patient does not require O2, they appear to be harmed. If anything, the hazard ratio goes the wrong direction, although the conference interval spans one. If they are on oxygen but not requiring mechanical ventilation, there appears to be a 20% reduction in death with a significant p-value there. And if they're on invasive mechanical ventilation or ECMO, it's a 35% reduction in death. And again, a significant p-value. The authors have summarized this in the up-to-date article saying, quote, confidence in the finding of mortality benefit is low for patients with COVID-19 who need oxygen supplementation and moderate for those who are on mechanical ventilation, in part given the effect size. So that's how they summarize it. Is that true? Is that accurate? Is that a fair summary? Or is that perhaps a bit of bias sneaking into the up-to-date article? So I'm going to say, go ahead and take a deep dive on that article. You picked one a week. 
Let it be this one. Dive into that article, and you can see that the authors have pre-specified these three subgroups along with a number of other pre-specified subgroups that they're going to look for interactions. This is the most significant interaction coefficient, though not the only one, less than seven days and seven days does have it. And you can ask yourself whether or not you think that that's an accurate characterization, that the subgroup on oxygen, not on the vent, that's only low confidence and it's higher confidence on the vent. I would disagree with that characterization. I think that's an incorrect characterization. If you look at the, the study, you will see that there is a consistent relationship between, I think, the stage of infectious uh, or inflammatory complication you're in and the benefit of the drugs, that the drugs appear to work look a little bit better, I think, in more severe disease and perhaps at a later state. Um, and thus, I think the fact that it's an intermediate um, result in that middle subgroup is actually more plausible than had it been as extreme as the most beneficial group. So I think I would disagree with that characterization. I think that's incorrect. You might pick that up when you read the article. And so I think that's why you got to go beyond up to date. They're not always 100% right. Again, the same rules to prioritize which reference to go in deep on are the same rules that prioritize what articles you read each week in the summary of the New England Journal or in the JAMA, which are the articles that are going to jump and make it uh, to your reading. So what do you think? Was the article right or was it slightly inaccurate? I've already spilled the beans. I told you what I thought. What made it inaccurate? I've also told you what I thought. Okay, that's it. You're done. This is how you do it. You keep up broadly with internal medicine and you learn from your patients. Just two parts to it. The first part is one article a week based on skimming the abstracts when they come out and keeping up on social media to see what people are saying. And the other one is one up-to-date article a day, but you're only diving in on one article a week. So two journal articles a week and a few up-to-date articles that, to be honest, you're probably going to be reading anyway when you're in the resident workroom, which is what I was doing a bit of the time, when I wasn't writing notes and being hammer-paged, of course. So... Why do I say this? Um, the last point, I think, is that Rome wasn't built in a day. Um, and, and neither is good critical thinking. People ask me, is there a single book you can read that will teach you how to be a good reader of the literature? I think that's unlikely um, that there will ever be such a book because it's a process. It's not a destination. Um, you're slowly building your critical thinking skills. You're going to get better with time, with a little bit of experience, and with the habit of reading. And the more you make this a habit and build it into your routine, the better off you will be going down the road. You're really apprenticing in a different craft, which is reading literature well. It's a different skill entirely. And just as Rome wasn't built in a day, um, your ability to do this well wasn't built in a day, but it will keep getting better. You just do this for six months, you'll be surprised how much better you are at reading articles simply by having read them before and in large number. So for folks interested in learning more, of course, uh, you know, if you had a long commute, uh, I would recommend you do some podcast listening to. I put out Plenary Session, which really is, I think, a deep dive trying to deconstruct, I think, many journal articles, although preferentially in my field and space of interest, benign hematology, classical hematology, malignant hematology, and of course, oncology, which is my interest. But, you know, we also get into some other topics as well. But whatever you find that uh, of interest, I think sometimes good topical podcasts that teach you how to critically appraise literature is a good idea. And that's it.